Well, I am Jane McGonigal, and I thought I would help you out a little bit by representing for you numerically exactly what kind of Buddhist geek that I am. I, I thought a lot about this on the plane ride down, did a lot of numbers, and I came up with 23% Buddhist and 77% geek. I was just doing the math to make sure that I add up to 100. That would have been really embarrassing <laughs> if it didn't. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so on average, I'd say about, I'm about three times as geeky as, as I am Buddhist. Um, uh, my geek credentials are really good. I'm a game designer. That's how I make my living. That's super geeky. Um, I have a PhD, which I earned for studying the impact of games on how we think and act in real life. So that's super duper geeky. And uh, even my husband and I, we have the GPS coordinates of where we met engraved on our wedding rings. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm latitude and he's longitude, so uh, that's really geeky. Um, and then uh, in terms of my Buddhist practice, uh, I discovered uh, Zen Buddhism when I was in graduate school and I was um, very stressed out and lonely and miserable and depressed and anxious, which is, if any of you have been in graduate school, you know that's a typical experience. And my twin sister, Kelly, who you heard this morning, introduced me to Zen Buddhism. And uh, so I started a daily meditation practice. I have literally more than a 1,000 podcasts on my laptop as we speak from series like uh, Buddhist Geeks. And, and, I've, and I've read you know, probably about, I don't know, 20 books um, on Zen Buddhist practice. So, so I'm getting there. I'm, if, if this is the spectrum, I don't know if I've gone over the tipping point yet. Um, there is a tipping point also for geeks, if you were curious. It usually involves the first time you play World of Warcraft, so I don't know <laughs> how many of you have okay, cut that. Okay, so uh, right. So I'm here to talk about the idea that awakening is an epic win. Um, and uh, how many of you will now out yourselves as gamers and know what epic win is? Okay, cool, right. So an epic win is when you not just do well, you know, there's a positive outcome, but it's a positive outcome so extraordinary and so unlikely that you never thought it was possible until you were right on the verge of achieving it. So you really shock yourself with what you're capable of. Um, and usually you get to an epic win by failing a lot. Again and again and again and again and again and again. You keep trying and you stay in there and then you achieve this epic win. Um, but I actually am sorry with all apologies to Rohan and, and the great people Buddhist geeks. This is not the title of my talk. Um, it actually appears in your program. It's a mistake. Sorry. Um, the actual title is that. Uh, awakening is an epic win. Uh, I've never given a talk uh, that, that even included the word Buddhism before, so um, I don't want you to think that I'm super confident up here about to impart to you some great wisdom that is absolutely 100% true and awesome. Um, These are just things that I've been thinking about. And actually what I hope is that as I spend most of my time talking about games and the way I see game design, that you will make connections yourselves um, and, and help me figure out if um, Awakening is an epic win. And if we're being really honest, I would say the actual title of the talk is that. Um, just to really underscore how many questions I have about this idea, um, three big questions, actually. So those three question marks represent three actual questions. Um, the first question is, do Buddhists and game designers share goals? Okay. Um, and I don't want to leave you in suspense for an hour, so I'll just preview <laughs> my conclusion now. Uh, I think so. I think that Buddhists and game designers share goals. The second question is, do Buddhists and game designers share methods? Are there similar ways that we go about trying to achieve this goal, whatever the goal might be? Um, and again, to preview the big surprise dramatic ending, um, I think that, that we do. And the last question is, could Buddhists and game designers share practices? Is there some future form of Buddhism that, um, that we play, that we play together? And, uh, I hope so. That is, that is the conclusion that I will, I hope maybe we'll all reach together by the end of the talk. Okay. Um, so just to give you a little bit more um, insight into where we're going, um, this is a book that I, I wrote earlier this year, um, Reality is Broken, which kind of sounds Buddhist a little bit. It has that sort of, you know, um, puzzling sound to it. Um, the subtitle is really important, Why Games Make Us Better 
and how they can change the world. Um, I do look at gaming as a practice, um, as a practice that changes the way that we think, changes the way we approach our real lives, um, and changes the way that we treat other people as well. Um, and, and so that's what I look at. I look at research that supports that idea, as well as games that we can make to intentionally provoke those changes, um, changes for the better. And so the first thing I want to do is uh, share with you a little bit about games and why I think games are a practice in the same way that, that Buddhism can be a practice. So um, this, this doesn't really look like a computer or video game, which we're going to talk a lot about computer and video games. Um, but this is still really important to think about gaming as a practice. These are actually sheep's knuckles um, for, that have been carved into uh, dice, ancient gaming dice. So these, these dice are thousands of years old. And, uh, and, and gaming is actually a very old practice, right? Gaming is an ancient tradition. Um, we've been playing games for thousands of years. And uh, I thought I would share with you this pretty interesting story about why we even have games at all. Um, many of you probably are familiar with the, the Greek historian Herodotus. He sort of invented history as we know it. And one of the histories that he wrote was the history of how games were invented. Who made the first game and why did they make it? Um, and what I love about his history is that the story has nothing to do with fun or entertainment, um, which is how we might think of games today. His history of why we have games um, has to do with suffering. So he writes about an ancient kingdom called Lydia and uh, the, the fact that they were suffering a terrible famine. Uh, it was a famine that lasted for years and years. And uh, people were suffering greatly, as you would imagine, during a famine. And so the king brought together the smartest people in the kingdom and asked them to come up with a solution to the suffering. They couldn't do anything about the famine. Uh, historians and geologists have actually shown now, much more currently, that there was a global climate change that, that was causing the famine. So there was nothing they could do about it. So they decided to invent games. They invented dice games, according to Herodotus. And what they did is they taught everybody in the kingdom to play the same games. And then they brought people together and would have them play games for the entire day. And they would get so caught up in the playing of the games that they would forget to eat, which is something if you know gamers or are a gamer, you know that still happens today. Uh, so uh, they would forget to eat, and then they would, they would end the day happy, but not having eaten. And then the next day, they wouldn't play games, but they would eat. And then on the third day, everybody would play games again, and they wouldn't eat. And then on the fourth day, they would eat. And Herodotus writes that they actually passed 18 years this way, surviving the famine, not fighting over resources, and most importantly, not suffering, coming together as a community and having this positive experience. Um, when I first found that story, um, it was while I was in graduate school, and it really resonated with what I felt about games. The games at their heart are about not suffering, about coming together and not suffering, um, which is not something you hear game developers say out loud a lot um, until I started you know, trying to uh, get people to think about it. So, so gaming is a practice. Uh, it's a social practice, right? This idea that we can come together and, and practice these games together. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's important to know that it's not just the ancient Lydians and it's not just us today. There's a really cool dissertation published earlier this year where a scholar looked at 100 years worth of archeological excavations in the Middle Eastern region of the world. And he looked at the catalog of all the objects that have been dug up over the past century. And it turned out that one in 10 objects that have been dug up over the past century all over the ancient world were game artifacts, right? So game boards, game tokens, one in 10. Um, and his dissertation is actually asking why we've ignored the centrality of play in these ancient kingdoms for so long. Um, but digging up uh, objects just like this, and then the other thing that they found is that the locations of these objects were in really densely populated parts um, of the cities, really the center where people would come and they would shop and they would come together. And so they seemed to have this really gathering effect, right? The game centers were always kind of the center of urban life um, in, in these ancient locations. So, so gaming is an ancient practice. It's a social practice. Um, it's a community practice. 
Now, it's also a practice that we spend a lot of time doing. We practice it a lot today. So right now, as a planet, we actually spend 3 billion hours a week playing online games. I'm mostly interested in, uh, in when it comes to electronic games, the games that are connected to the internet or connected to a network, so mobile phones, PC, console games that are connected. And that's a 3 billion hours a week. That's, that's a lot of time. So it's, a pra it's an ancient practice, it's a social practice, a community practice that we spend a lot of time doing, and um, there are a lot of us practicing it. So when I first started tracking gamers around the world a few years ago, this was the number I came up with, more than 500 million people globally who spend at least an hour a day playing online games. That's a lot, a lot of practitioners, and you can kind of see where on the map that, that these folks are, are practicing. So just in the past couple of years, to give you a sense of how many more practitioners we're getting uh, every day. This number's actually bumped up to 800 million global gamers. Um, you can see in the US, we got another 10 million. But looking over at China, where gaming has really exploded over the last couple of years, there are up 145 million practitioners of gaming. Um, and India has exploded, 96 million now practitioners of gaming. So uh, that's a lot of people involved in this practice. Um, particularly in the younger generation, uh, we are moving towards a future in which it seems like everybody will practice gaming. Uh, in the US, currently 99% of boys under 18 and 94% of girls play games regularly. So there's no gender divide anymore with gamers, right, and who practices. For boys, it's on average 13 hours a week, and for girls, an average of eight hours a week. So there's a little bit of an intensity gap. The boys do play more, but virtually everyone plays which uh, led one, uh, one famous media critic uh, to say, famously, it's inevitable, soon we will all be gamers. And I would like to tell you that your time has come, your day has come. If you're not a gamer yet, you are going to become a gamer in the next five minutes. <laughs> we are gonna play a game together. <laughs> And it's gonna be awesome. Because I thought if we're talking about gaming as a practice, why well, we should practice it a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you a game that very few people know how to play. And uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure none of you have played it before. I'll just check. Has anybody ever played massively multiplayer thumb wrestling before? <laughs> Wait a minute, can I see your name tag? Kiaj Monsef, oh my God, would you please stand up? Oh my God, this is very shocking. Uh, I have no idea what you're doing here. This is the current reigning world champion of massively multiplayer thumb wrestling. Uh, are you a Buddhist geek? What are you doing here? I, I heard there was going to be a massively multiplayer thumb wrestling event here in Rosemary, and uh, I came to defend my title. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, that is really just up the ante a little bit. Okay, well, why don't you join me on stage to help, help me teach uh, people? Um, and maybe I could uh, Im implore you to come as well, my, my sister Kelly back on stage. Okay. Never played. Never played, awesome. And you don't really play games, so this is very exciting for me to get my sister to finally play games with me, yay. Um, so <laughs> gamers, how many of you know how to play normal thumb wrestling? Could you raise your thumb if you know how to play normal thumb wrestling. All right, good, this is good. Um, so we're gamers. Two people, two thumbs, that is too easy for us, right? We're gonna need to do a more advanced version, okay? So the first thing that's really important is that you need more than two thumbs in your node. You need at least three thumbs in a node. And the way you play is you attempt to be the first person to pin someone else's thumb. Don't, oh, cheater, when you hear the word go. <laughs> and you don't wanna be just, let's say you pin me, she would not be the winner just hanging back, you know. That's not a decent strategy. You have to actually go for it and pin somebody down, okay? So he would win, he was the first one down. Yeah, see, not too easy. Okay, now, but gamers, this is actually pretty hard, three thumbs going, but you know, we're gamers. Um, you can, we can do more than this. Um, so if you wanted to, for example, you could have that many thumbs in a node. So I don't want to hold you back. You can go there. Um, but still, this is still easy. You're just using one of your thumbs. You know, what we should really do is have everybody reach out their other thumb. And why don't you uh, grab me here? And uh, Ethan, if you'd be so kind. And that way I can have 
both of my thumbs wrestling at the same time, and you could each reach out your thumbs, and you would grab two more. Okay, so uh, that's good. That's how it works. Um, why don't you get ready to defend your championship? And uh, just to give you a little more insight into what we're going to do here, so we are going to get everybody connected into one node. And uh, you like a good game. It can get harder over time. I don't want you to strain yourselves today, but there are higher levels of the game. <laughs> this is called the Death Star configuration. Um, and you can actually, with just a few people, both of your thumbs in the same node, it's very, this is the, the mega Death Star. Um, and that <laughs> is what we'll be doing at Buddhist Geeks 2012, I think. That was actually decided in the breakout session because you guys will be so good at it by then. Okay, but back to this idea. So what we're gonna do is the first thing we have to do, this is the most important part of the game, is every thumb in this room must be in a node and there must be at least three thumbs in each node. I'm gonna give you one minute to make this happen. Go. I have to say, I am very impressed. I am very impressed. So let me just unpack for you a little bit. Uh, well, let's find out. <laughs> so let me unpack for you a little bit uh, about how game designers think about game design. Um, so you can start to see maybe uh, how game designers and Buddhists share the same goals, maybe some of the same methods. So. Um, what, what I think about as a game designer is I think about productivity in a kind of a weird way. We usually don't think of games as being a productive way to spend our time, but it really depends on how you define productive. You know, what is it that you actually want to produce more of? So um, I have a set of four things that I try to produce when I create games, and, uh, and, and let's see how we did with this playing this game together. Uh, so the first is positive emotion, right? Games produce a lot of positive emotion, a lot of uh, excitement and uh, joy and that sort of thing. And I would have to say, based on the smiles and the laughters and the energy level that I saw, I would give a check that massively multiplayer thumb wrestling provoked, uh, produced a little bit of positive emotion. Uh, game designers also think about strengthening relationships, right? Um, so, did we do any good relationship work here? Well, since this is a geeky Buddhist geeks conference, uh, I can share with you a little science hack. So game designers like to use science, build in a little bit of um, proven scientifically backed activities into their games. So, many of you are probably familiar with oxytocin, which is the, the hormone chemical in the body that makes us like other people more, makes us more trusting of them, make us feel bonded to them. When we have high levels of oxytocin, we're more likely to help somebody else. Um, and uh, one of the fastest ways to increase the oxytocin in your bloodstream is to hold somebody else's hand for six seconds. So uh, we were all just holding hands for way more than six seconds, which means if you met somebody and you kind of wanted to ask them for a favor or something at this conference, <laughs> this is a really good time in the next hour to, <laughs> to do that. Okay, so we, we strengthened our relationships a little bit. We got oxytocin going. Uh, meaning is something that we think about a lot as game designers. You know, again, games we often think of as being trivial, you know, maybe a waste of time. But gamers are very interested in meaning. Um, they're interested in the sense of having a, a heroic purpose, of, of being a part of something that is bigger than themselves, right? So that they, that they can see their humble role that they play in some grander scheme. And you see that with games that involve you in massively multiplayer communities, so there are millions of you playing together, or that have um, these really awe-inspiring environments. A lot of video games are, um, very similar to cathedrals or sanctuaries and how they're designed to create goosebumps and choke you up and make you feel small in, in the, the, these vast architectures. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of meaningful about massively multiplayer thumb wrestling is that right now there are only about 25,000 people in the world who uh, know how to play this game. And so now it's up to you. If you would like to be sacred guardians of this secret, and protect it, you can do that. You're one of the few who know. Or maybe you will choose to pass it on and share and teach others and see about spreading this uh, to a larger community. That's how the meaning you find in that is up to you. And then finally, accomplishment. 
Um, we know gamers, and this is something that, you know, when my sister and I talk about Buddhism and is it like gaming and is, are gamers sort of on the path to awakening, um, this is the one that is really the stickiest, I think, um, and maybe is, is the least like Buddhist practice, um, which is the idea of accomplishment, you know, the sense of pride when you learn something new um, and when you master it, you know, but I think there is accomplishment in Buddhism and that we we're, we're have to learn something new and we have to master new skills so that we can actually do the practice. Um, so let's see if we actually got some accomplishment here. How many of you uh, successfully participated in this practice, the Mastering the Thumb Wrestling? All right, well done, that's great. So we have some accomplishment. Um, how many of you are like me? I never win either thumb. Let's, okay, all right, good job. You are now accomplished massively multiplayer thumb wrestles and that you successfully completed a game together. So well done, there are only 25,000 of you on the planet, that's pretty impressive. Um, how many of you were able to win one thumb? Nice, all right, you guys are now master massively multiplayer thumb wrestlers, so wear that badge of honor pride. Did any brave soul manage to win two thumbs? Wow, so you guys are legendary master, master of the thumb wrestlers. I was gonna ask if anybody beat Kiyosh so we could crown a new world champion, but you won both thumbs again? All right, I guess I'll see, where's our next stop? I'll have to see you for the next uh, 2012. You'll come back and defend your title. Okay, so that's how game designers think about what we're creating in gamers, right? So we're not just trying to make entertainment, we're trying to produce these four things that, that have a, a special role you know, in our lives. If you're trying to remember this, by the way, it spells PERMA, so it's a useful acronym for positive emotions, relationship, meaning, and accomplishment. And uh, there's a great book, if you're really geeky like me and, and wanna read more about the science, by the founder of positive psychology, the science of happiness, Martin Seligman, has a new book out where he talks about the PERMA framework um, in relationship to real life and how these four things, positive emotion, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment, are actually what help us lead a life worth living um, and to be, um, as Ethan might say, it, decent human beings. And so, um, so that's something that game designers think a lot about. Um, but I thought that you could do a Buddhist read on massively multiplayer thumb wrestling. Um, you know, I think it's a pretty cool game because trying to wrestle two thumbs at once, I think is kind of like a koan. Like, just live with that for a second. How do you wrestle two thumbs at once? It's kind of a puzzle. And if you actually tried to do it, it's pretty much impossible. Um, and if you were to try it again and again and again, keep trying to wrestle two thumbs at the same time, um, maybe you would actually get to some mini enlightenment. I think you would. Um, and I also like the fact that the most important thing is not how you do in your individual node, um, but that we were all connected in one big node, um, and that we were actually, you might have been really focused on the game that you were playing, but if you can actually zoom out and see the bigger picture, what was really happening is that we were all playing together, and every one of us in the room was connected to every other in the room. So I think you could also do a kind of a, a fun Buddhist read on that too. Okay, um, so what is it about games that produces PERMA um, and, and, and lets us think about them as possibly ending suffering? Um, well, I'd like to share with you my favorite definition of a game, which has nothing to do with some things that we associate with video or computer games. It's not about graphics or special effects. It's not about points or achievement badges or, um, or even winning. Um, really, it's that games are unnecessary obstacles that we choose to tackle. And I would add to that, there are unnecessary obstacles that we choose to tackle and the outcome doesn't matter to us, that we are okay with any outcome. So let me give you an example here uh, to sort of see how this definition works. Let's take golf. Golf is a great game to look at as an unnecessary obstacle, right? Yeah, I think you see where I'm going already. So in golf, you have a goal. What's your goal in golf? Get the little ball in the little hole. So imagine you're not playing a game. Imagine this is real life, and you have the goal of getting a little ball in a little hole. How would you achieve this very important goal? You would pick up the ball, and you would walk over to the hole, and you would very carefully put the ball in your hole. You'd be like, yeah, I did it, I'm so productive. And maybe you would like make a machine that would bring all the balls to you and just drop them in the hole for you, and that would be great. And that's, that would we do, that's what we do in real life, right? We try and make everything easier. 
But in games, we try and make everything harder, right? So even though our goal is to get a little ball in a little hole, we do something really stupid. We, we stand really far away from the hole, which is very not useful for, for trying to get in the hole. And then to make it worse, we, for some reason, decide to use a stick to aim the ball. I mean, it'd be a lot easier if we could at least just like throw it or something. So we put these two big obstacles in the way of the goal. And then what's funny is as you start to get good at getting a little ball in a little hole standing really far away with a big stick, you don't just celebrate how good you are at that now. Instead, you make it harder. You start putting sand traps and obstacles and hazards. And, and the better you get, the harder you make it, right? So that's the definition of a game. That's, that's how we know we have the heart of a game. It's something that you want to be challenging for no good reason, right? And what is it that we like about that? You know, we like that it provokes curiosity. You know, oh, can I do that? I, I kind of want to try. I want to see if I can do that. I've never tried that before. And it provokes a sense of mastery or learning, right? We have the chance to get good at something that we were really bad at. We had no idea how to do it. And we get better over time. And usually, these obstacles are social in nature. We can watch other people tackle them, and we can learn from them. We can share ideas, and we can kind of work together to get better at it. And then over time, as a community, we actually do get better at it together. So imagine how bad golf players were when they just invented golf, right? Compared to how good someone like Tiger Woods is today. We sort of collectively move forward our understanding of this game. So when you think about it that way, one good way to describe games is that playing games is hard work, right? So we think of work as usually you know, the opposite of play. But in fact, playing games is hard work. And one idea that I'd just like to throw out here for the future of Buddhism and games is that games might be a very interesting working meditation. Maybe we'll come back to that at the end of the talk, because we are working when we play games. Um, so let's fast forward to computer and video games. Here's a great unnecessary obstacle that many people are tackling today. This game's Angry Birds, if you don't know it. There have been more than 200 million downloads of this game to different people, and on average, three people play each download. So we're talking about 600 million people who have played this game in the past year. I mean, that's, talk about the number of people you could possibly reach sneaking a little compassion into a game. And this is, I, okay. You will probably think I'm going too far here. But this game, there is a little bit of compassion involved. So for those of you who played, you might see where I'm going here. There are these poor birds, and they are angry. <laughs> because these pigs have stolen their little baby eggs. And your job is to uh, basically obliterate the pigs, <laughs> which is not very Buddhist. But because these poor little birds, and they're so sad, and they're angry, and you're going to get in there, and, uh, and you're going to help them out. OK. Well, you could see how you could make an even more compassionate version of that. But 600 million people playing this game, uh, doing a little bit of hard work in their spare time. So imagine Angry Birds, the working meditation. I'm just throwing ideas out here. I don't actually have a good solution to that. Just you know, think about it. Uh, Farmville. Farmville's great. Farmville's actually a game where you can go to any other player's farm. So Angry Birds is just my birds on my phone, your birds on your phone. In Farmville, if you're playing and I'm playing, we can go to each other's farms. So Farmville maxed out at 132 million players all playing in the same virtual world. Now that is the most number of people we've ever had playing the same game at the same time in the history of humanity. Um, so, you know, thinking about the scale of people that we can reach and engage, um, this is really where it's at. And Farmville's interesting because it's a game where you help other people, right? Um, the fundamental game mechanic, it's a social game, and you have to go to other people's, your friends' farms, and you have to feed their chickens for them, and water their crops for them, and give them nails to build their barn, right? This whole sort of barnstorming that happens in these games. So it's actually, you know, it's all about helping and cooperation. Then there are games like World of Warcraft, which, um, which are really interesting in terms of how, hard, how much hard work they are. Um, the average World of Warcraft player spends 22 hours a week playing this game, so basically a part-time job. And what's, what's interesting is it takes, on average, 500 hours to reach level 80, which is where, if you ask any WoW player, they'll tell you that's where the fun really starts. 
So this is a game where you have to play for 500 hours before the fun starts. That's crazy. That's really crazy. And you have to think about why that is. Um, it's because of the, the essential nature of gameplay, that what we're actually there for is to be engaged in hard work and to be striving to make ourselves better, right? That's what's going on in these games. Uh, it kind of makes you think of the old Noel Coward saying, uh, the, the dramatist Noel Coward. He said that work is more fun than fun. Um, and what's really going on when these play these games, tackling these obstacles, is that we are wholeheartedly engaging with difficult challenges with work. You know, but why is work more fun than fun? Oh, no, first some more geeky numbers for you. Um, if you add up all of the time that we've spent playing just World of Warcraft, for example, it's 5.93 million years. Well, we can put that number in, in context. 5.93 million years ago, the first human ancestors stood up so by that measure, players have been tackling unnecessary obstacles in Azeroth for as long as we've been walking the Earth. And it's not just that game. You can actually think about other games in, in this framework. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I've contributed at least a year to the Halo years, I want to say, and, and, and probably a year and a half to Rock Band, um, which I'm very proud of. And you know, the reason why I made this visualization um, is because I do think that the games we play together do change us as a society um, and maybe make us better prepared to survive the future. You know, I'm not saying that we evolve genetically, gamers have different DNA. But what I'm saying is that as a species, when we have 800 million people spending an hour a day playing online games, and we have 600 million people playing the same game, um, it does sort of change our makeup as a society and what we're capable of. Okay, but why are we spending so much time tackling unnecessary obstacles? I mean, why does this engage us more than anything else? And one of the things I was thinking about in preparing this talk was, you know, how hard it is even for myself to keep a daily meditation practice. And when I have that spare time, what, what do I want to do? You know, what I want to do is I want to engage. Um, the people who, the 600 million people picking up their phones to play five minutes of Angry Birds, they could easily meditate in those five minutes. But instead, they decide to tackle this little task, this little work. Um, and what is it about wanting to engage in hard work? And by the way, I should say, I think meditation is hard work, and I think the practice is hard work, but we don't necessarily communicate that to others. Particularly when you see somebody meditating, pictures of meditation, it looks like you're kind of passive, and it looks like you're opting out. It looks, doesn't look like actually what we know, what we feel, how engaging it is, and how focused you have to be. Um, that's one of the, Rohan's gonna talk about how the aesthetics of meditation is broken. I actually think one of the things that we could do to fix the communication of the aesthetic of meditation is to convey how engaging it is. Um, because when people are tackling unnecessary obstacles, it's because they wanna be engaged. This is a quote from a theorist of play, a psychologist of play. He's been studying play since before there were uh, video games. Brian Sutton Smith is his name. And he wrote that the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. And here we get back to the idea of suffering. Um, when you're depressed, there are really two major elements. Uh, the first is that you have a despondent lack of energy, right? You just don't feel like engaging with the world, you withdraw into yourself. And the second is a pessimistic sense of your own capabilities. Uh, you just, you don't think that if you make an effort um, that, that you will, you'll find much success. So if you were to reverse these two traits, you would get something like an invigorating rush of energy and an optimistic sense of your own capabilities. And uh, I'm not sure there's a good clinical word for that in psychology. Some of you might be able to suggest one. Flourishing, maybe, to use Marty Seligman's term. But I think it's a perfect definition of how we feel when we play a good game. We feel energized. If you've seen when the energy in the room lifted a lot when we did our massively multiplayer thumb wrestling. Um, and you can see somebody will come home from a long day of work or a long day at school, tired, exhausted. They start playing a game. Suddenly it's four hours, six hours later, it doesn't matter how late it is, they could keep going, they're wide awake, they're ready to go. There's this energizing effect of gameplay. And then there's the optimism that comes with gaming. One thing that I like about gamers is you never see them sit down in front of a game they've never played before and then say something like, I don't know why I'm playing, I'm gonna be the worst player ever, 
I'm totally gonna fail this game. Instead, what you see is, ah, new game. I'm totally gonna figure this out. I'm gonna totally get this. And then you see, once they start to get it, you see, ah, I'm getting good at that. I'm gonna be the best player ever. I'm gonna get the highest score. I'm gonna get the fastest time, right? And you see that sort of leveling up of optimism the more gamers play. And that's actually been measured in labs, that playing games actually makes you measurably more optimistic, even for 24 hours afterwards. So, let's see. Why does this happen? You know, what's going on? Let's geek out a little bit. Um, there's a great word that I think summarizes what's happening in our minds and bodies when we, when we play a game, when we tackle an unnecessary obstacle. The word is you stress, which is the positive form of stress. Sort of think of it as the opposite of distress. Um, we normally we talk about stress as, as the negative kind, as pressure from us externally to do something that we feel like we can't do or we don't want to do. We don't have the time or the resources or the talent or we just don't care. And when we have that kind of external pressure, then there are things that happen in our body, right? Um, our adrenaline can start racing. Our heart rate might go up. Our breathing rate might quicken. The blood flow in our brain might change to really go to the parts of the brain, which Kelly will know the term for and I won't, where sent, uh, attention happens, where focus on a threat happens. Um, and, and when we experience these things because of an external pressure, then we have anxiety. We have resentment. We have anger. All these physiological changes. But what's really interesting is when we play a game or we do something in our real lives that we've chosen to do, yes, it's hard, yes, it's a challenge, but we wanted to do it, we have all of these same physiological reactions. You know, our heart rate might go up, our breathing rate might quicken, we might get some adrenaline going, the blood flow is gonna change in our brains. But instead of experiencing it as anxiety or anger or frustration, we experience it as excitement, as motivation, as drive, and we have a positive feeling of the same physiological response. So it's a different story that we're telling ourselves about what's happening in our bodies. Now this is just interesting, obviously, from a Buddhist perspective, that you can take the same physiological set and relatively same activities, you know, doing something that's challenging for us, doing something that we might fail at, um, and one story tells us to feel angry and frustrated and anxious, and the other story tells us to feel excited and motivated and we're totally gonna win. So when we're in a state of positive stress, this is what we look like. This is actually a face of a gamer taken while he was playing one of his favorite games. They set the camera up right behind the screen. And, uh, and yeah, you know, it's great just to see what gaming looks like. Um, face to face. You can see here, he's really kind of relishing the task. He's working hard, but he feels really capable. Uh, this is another face of you stress. <laughs> so a lot of determination here, right? A, a real intensity of focus. Uh, this is a face of you stress. So, you know, another gamer here. Um, you can see that this is probably a very difficult game. Um, and he's bringing all of the resources he has to bear. Uh, this is a face that we associate with the phenomenon of flow, uh, that kind of blissed out, totally engaged state that we get in when we're doing something right at the very edge of our abilities, where it's really hard for us, but we can just almost do it. Um, and so this is really a kind of joy, right? The, the, the founder of um, flow theory, Csikszentmihalyi, said that this was actually the peak experience that we could achieve as, as human beings, is to be totally engaged with something that we can just barely do. Um, now this, I love this one, it's my favorite, because if you didn't know he was playing a game, you would be totally worried about him, right? <laughs> his, his nostrils are flaring, his eyes are dilated, and his, his lips are pursed. Um, but if you study the micro-expressions in his face, so I'm lucky enough to work with researchers at UC Berkeley who specialize in the telltale cues of little muscles in our face that we normally don't pick up on, and there's a crinkling up around his lips and eyes that actually indicate optimism here. And I think this is fascinating because you can tell from what's going on here that he's almost certainly about to fail, right? I mean, this is not looking good for him at all, but he's optimistic. And that's really interesting uh, as, as a core gamer state to be almost certainly going to fail, but you still hang in there, you still make the effort, um, and maybe, maybe you'll succeed and maybe you won't. Now, 
if you do keep working hard and optimistically in a, in a setting where you will probably fail, then sometimes you get to that epic win that we were talking about, that positive outcome that was so extraordinary, you didn't think it was possible. Um, so if this is the kind of before picture for an epic win, I like to think of this as the after picture for the epic win. This is that feeling of, of really just sort of ecstatic surprise when, when you discover that you are capable of something that you didn't think that you were capable of before. Um, and uh, then, you know, maybe some of us feel that way when we have an insight in meditation, when we actually have that breakthrough moment where we can see something that we'd never seen before, right? That could be an epic win, but it's really hard to get there. And we might have to meditate 30 days in a row and fail to have that insight uh, until we get there. I like to compare these to what I call the I'm not good at life face, um, which is the way a lot of us can feel in ordinary life because of the way that we think about life. We think that life is full of necessary challenges, necessary obstacles that we have to get up and deal with. And we don't approach the challenges in our lives as unnecessary obstacles, obstacles that we can choose to deal with, that we can bring optimism and energy and, and determination to, even in the face of possible or likely failure. Um, what I talk about a lot in my book is what the state of eustress really brings out in gamers. There's lots and lots of science on this, and just to summarize it for you, gaming seems to unleash our natural ability to be more curious, more optimistic, more energized, more joyous, more focused, more determined, yet open to failure. Totally okay if we fail. Um, and then I put in parentheses because I think this one's a little bit controversial. This is not as much in the literature, the scientific literature. This is just something I see, so I put in parentheses. Um, to be fully present, um, when we're playing games, we don't ruminate on anything else. We don't have other stories going on in our mind. And there is something about gaming in that way that I think is similar to meditation. Um, a lot of people play games during difficult times in their lives to avoid ruminating on it, um, which can make depression worse or make anxiety worse. Um, and, uh, and just to be fully present to the moment. But of course, games in that sense are distraction. So it's not exactly being fully present to our lives. It's like being fully present to a different life. And that's why I have it in parentheses. It's not exactly mindfulness, but there's something, there's something there, that sense of being fully present to the challenges in front of us. They just happen to be unnecessary challenges, fictional challenges. Um, now, what I think is interesting about this list is how similar it is to the kind of virtues that we associate with trying to become enlightened, of trying to reach that insight, right? Um, so, this list here, the curiosity and the brightness, the joy and concentration, the idea of right effort, um, really determined but okay with any results, that sort of equanimity that we aspire to. Um, so we're not, uh, if you think about a good gamer, a good gamer, a good sport, has equanimity whether they win or lose, right? Um, and then of course mindfulness. And I think there's an interesting overlap between these techniques that are supposed to bring you to enlightenment um, and the techniques, the skills that gamers are actually developing. I don't know what this means, I'm just giving it to you as something interesting that I saw. Possibly it means that Super Mario is a Buddhist, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Who wants to take a picture of that slide? It's really awesome. You guys know you want to tweet it. I'll give you a moment before I go on. I know. Okay. Click, click, click. Good. Okay. Right. So maybe maybe that's what we're uh, maybe that's what we're really saying. Um, I think that gamers and Buddhist practitioners are super empowered, hopeful individuals. They're people who have built and broadened themselves to be open to challenges, to be able to rise to the occasion and participate wholeheartedly in the world around them, with all of those traits that we mentioned: the curiosity, the brightness, the determination. And the fact that young people today, if you were born after 1980, the more likely, more, later after 1980 you were born, the more likely this is to be true, um, that these young people have accumulated 10,000 hours of practice at gaming by the age of 21. Um, that's something interesting to think about. Imagine young people accumulating 10,000 hours of Buddhist practice by the age of 21. Um, 
oh, they have 10,000 hours of gaming practice by the age of 21. And it turns out that this kind of practice in gaming does make you better able to go out into the real world and tackle incredible challenges to be a part of social engagement and social impact wholeheartedly um, in, in ways that we're just starting now to see with game design. Um, I kind of sort of asked this question, you know, what are we practicing for? What are these kids spending these 10,000 hours if gaming is a practice? What's the actual outcome? And of course, I, you know, a lot of, actually, I don't know, I shouldn't say we all agree on this. Um, I had an interesting conversation with um, practitioners of, of mindfulness meditation this past week um, who said that they felt that you practice meditation in order to be, go out in the world and be more loving and that to practice love everywhere you go. Um, so what would it mean for gamers to go out and practice these virtues in the world? Ooh, low battery, uh-oh. What will we do then? Um, so here are a couple games where people are going out in the world and using their gamer virtues, their skills that might lead to awakening um, for real life, good. This is a game called Fold It. It was created by researchers at the University of Washington who thought that gamers might like to help cure cancer in their spare time. Um, and so these are biochemists who are working on something called protein folding, which looks at how different proteins in the human body fold into more or less stable configurations. And everything that happens in our body biochemically happens through protein folding. And if proteins fold up in an unstable shape, we get diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's. So scientists want to look for all of the most stable configurations, but it turns out that there are so many different parts to each protein and so many different ways that they can twist and bend that it takes supercomputers more than a year to test all of the configurations for just one possible protein for one disease. And there are countless proteins in our body. So what they did is they decided to make a game because maybe gamers would be better at this than supercomputers. So they created an interface. It's a little bit complicated, but not more complicated than that World of Warcraft interface that we were looking at earlier. And it teaches the gamers to look for stable protein shapes. Well, it turns out that after just six months of 50,000 gamers playing together in the spare time, the players were able to co-author a paper for Nature Journal, the most prestigious scientific journal, uh, publishing the findings that they had actually beat supercomputers on five out of 10 challenges in just six months of training, and one team of players actually stumbled upon a protein shape that no scientist, working professional scientists, had come up with before. They've actually started manufacturing it in the lab to test it as a possible medicine for cancer. So, and 99% of these players, they did a survey, had no training, formal training in biochemistry. So I think this is pretty cool. These are just gamers, ordinary gamers, who decided to use their virtues of curiosity and optimism and determination to uh, try to cure cancer instead of just solving, you know, saving the virtual world, maybe save the real world. So we talked about Farmville a little bit and how you have to help your friends in the game by going to fertilize their crops and feed their chickens. Well, a friend of mine was wondering, if we're so willing to feed each other's virtual uh, chickens and water each other's virtual crops, would we be willing to do that in the real world? So he has a platform called Ground Crew, and you set it up on your phone, and you tell it when it can bother you, maybe only on weekends, maybe only on weekdays after 5 p.m., and it looks for where you are, and it gives you social impact missions, including possibly a request to water some crops or feed some chickens, but they're real crops because you're walking down the street and there's a community garden around the corner. Or you know, it's a real chicken because there's an urban farming project in your neighborhood. And, uh, and so you can actually play Farmville in the real world. So this is pretty cool. And it's working. Uh, Ground Crew's worked, wa working with a group called Garden Angels and they've set up these test garden centers and they've increased by a factor of more than 100 times the number of volunteers participating in the gaming gardens since they set up this platform. So gardens that used to have four volunteers suddenly had 400. You can imagine in a local community what that increase in scale of participation could do for this really important social action, right? Trying to feed ourselves healthier locally and sustainably. The last game I wanna show you is called Evoke. And it's actually a game that I made. 
Um, we made it with the World Bank Institute, and the goal of this game was to teach young people, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, how to start their own social enterprises. So how to start a business that would not only allow them to make a living, but also to tackle a social challenge like hunger or poverty or climate change. Um, the problem was that most of the young people in sub-Saharan Africa did not see themselves as being in a real position to actively engage with these challenges. Um, they did, certainly did not see them as unnecessary obstacles, and they really doubted their own ability to do anything um, that would really matter. So I think I'll just show you the trailer for the game, and, uh, and which uh, was made by the world champion of massive multiplayer thumb wrestling, Kiyash, who's also here. And after we watch the trailer, then I'll tell you about how the game worked. Alchemy, and this is an urgent evoke. Wherever you are, whoever you are, if you found this message, it's your destiny to join us. Solve it alone. Evoke it. So, uh, by the way, that URL, urgentevoke.com, the game is still live if you're interested in uh, getting a group together to play it. Um, what we did is we put this trailer online. Um, we shared it with some schools around Sub-Saharan Africa. We also sent out a text message that said free job training in the job of inventing the future to um, mobile phones across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and when they came to the site, which you could use on your mobile phone or on a typical computer, they found this world uh, set 10 years in the future. You can see here it's uh, February 13th, 2020. They're in Tokyo, and there's a famine in Tokyo. And um, who have they reached out to for help? They have reached out to this underground network of kind of superhero problem solvers located in Africa. Because it turns out that the people who have spent the past decade tackling problems on the ground in Africa, where the challenges are so intense and the resources are so scarce, that they've actually become the superheroes of the future the, through the creativity they've developed, through the determination and resourcefulness that they've developed. So you can follow this online interactive graphic novel to see stories about people coming out from Sub-Saharan Africa to help the rest of the world, to help Rio de Janeiro deal with the disruption of the energy grid. Rio loses its power, and these heroes come to help set up more sustainable energy sources. Or when there's an outbreak of cholera in London, it's these innovators who come to London and teach them about clean water access. So you would come to the site, you would read the story, and since it is about superheroes, we asked you to imagine yourself in the year 2020. How would you go from who you are today to being somebody who would be the Spider-Man, the Superman of tomorrow? Every superhero has an origin story, right? So Peter Parker got bit by the radioactive spider, and that's how he became Spider-Man. Over 10 weeks, we asked you 10 questions to help you imagine yourself 
being this, this sort of super empowered version of yourself? What's the motivation? What's the spark that fuels your heroic effort? Who are your dream allies? Who would you team up with if you could team up with anyone in the world? You know, who are the bad guys? What is it that you really worked up to try and address and confront and help, uh, help overcome? So if you completed all 10 questions, you actually had this really interactive kind of online resume or calling card that could help you attract mentors in the future. But mentors for what? Well, we also had weekly missions that were tied to the story where we asked you to go out in the real world and actually try to solve one of these problems today. So the week that we looked at the power shift, for example, in Rio and the disruption of the energy network, we asked you to change how you powered something that you used in everyday life to a more sustainable energy source. So solar power for a light bulb or kinetic power for your cell phone. And then you would document what you were doing with social media, blog posts, photos, and videos. So you'd have to show us that you were actually doing this in reality. So for example, here was a player who, the week that we looked at the food, the famine in Tokyo, decided to set up an urban farm in his community. He's actually a player in Mexico City. This was a player who, the week that we looked at um, new energy sources, decided to set up uh, an offer his neighbors and friends to power their electronics with his bike, sort of converting his bike into an electronic powering station so he could submit a video so other people could learn how to do that. Other players would give you feedback, positive feedback on what you'd submitted by giving you plus ones, just like in a role playing game, plus one courage or plus one entrepreneurship or plus one sustainability. So this would represent one player's total skill level over time. If you completed all 10 quests and all 10 missions, the World Bank Institute actually certified you as a social innovator. So you had this sort of outcome, this learning outcome. And uh, we managed to enroll just under 20,000 students from over 130 countries for our first 10-week pilot study. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, it was a really global audience. One thing we found, we were really asked to focus on South Africa in particular, but it turned out there are a lot of young people in the United States, unemployed after graduating from college or having a hard time in this economy, who not only wanted to start their own businesses, but actually wanted to save the world. Um, so that was really interesting to see. So at the end of the 10 weeks, if you had completed all of the missions, it turned out that you had actually created a business plan for your own social enterprise, right? So there's actually a tangible outcome. And if you wanted to, you could actually put this business plan up online on a website called Global Giving where you could raise money to start the business for real, where you could attract mentors to support the business for real. So we had more than 50 teams actually go forward with this process and actually start real social enterprises in India, in Nigeria, Uganda, China, Jordan, even in the United States. Just to give you my favorite example, there's a group of gamers um, actually based in the United States who decided to work with players in Africa to start something called Libraries Across Africa. And this is the kind of creative idea that you could only have, I think, from really opening yourself up in a game environment. They decided to make libraries more like McDonald's. So McDonald's has this great franchise system. I don't know how much you've traveled. McDonald's are everywhere. There's basically not one, one square mile on the planet without a McDonald's. So the gamers were like, how could we make libraries that ubiquitous and spread like McDonald's? So they decided to set up a franchise system for libraries. If you wanted to make a living in Africa, you could do it by setting up a library. And they would show you exactly physically how to set it up, they would help you get the books. They would encourage you to loan the books for free, obviously, to be in the franchise. You have to loan the books for free. But you could also make money by selling snacks at the library or by charging people cell phones. So they've actually raised enough money to start this program, put it into practice. They have their pilot libraries up and running, and they're studying this. Um, and they're going. And, you know, More than a year after the game, this is their job now, players of the game. Um, so not bad for 10 weeks of playing a game. When I look at Evoke, I see the outcome is really what, what I'm trying to create in the world, which is wholehearted participation, um, really bringing all of ourselves optimistically, with curiosity, with a determination towards a goal that we, we, we want to help, we want to be there for others, but um, we're open to failure. We know that's a possibility, and so we'll try anyway. 
And, uh, and I think that this is what games are doing. So let's see if we can answer some of these questions. Do Buddhists and game designers share goals? Um, I think that we do. I do think that many game designers, particularly people working in the space where games and, and reality are blurring, are trying to end suffering, are trying to help people wake up and be the best versions of themselves, and then to bring those virtues and, and abilities to the world around them to help others. Do Buddhists and game designers share methods? I think they do. I think that we broaden our perspective to be more aware of others, to be aware of the world that we're a part of, and to build skills and abilities that allow us to be that best version of ourselves. Now, could Buddhists and game designers share practices? Um, well, you know, I hope they will, and in fact, they already are. One more game to show you. Uh, this is actually the, the center that I spend the most time listening to podcasts from and reading books from and going to meditation sessions with. Um, and they've made a game. They've just started a game. You can actually play this if you're interested to go online and see what a Buddhist game might be like. They've called it a Sangha-wide participation game. They're participating together to raise money for Africa. They're going to play it from June to October of this year. And their goal is to collectively earn 10,000 points. And people are pledging to support this effort. If you reach 10,000 points, I will pledge a penny for every point, or I'll pledge a dime for every point. And the way you earn points, you can do things like you can listen to the podcast, you can uh, call into the radio show and talk about your meditation practice, you can make a donation, you can, uh, you can participate in uh, a bridge walk to raise attention, um, you can even just tweet uh, uh, an idea for uh, awareness practice. So that's how people are raising points, and I think it's just kind of a fun way to see a little bit of gaming brought into the Buddhist practice. The last thing I want to do is, you know, I told you I have a lot of question marks around here. I don't have a lot of answers, but I, I do think that this could be an interesting conversation. So I thought in just the last couple of minutes, just to sort of let's practice what it would be like to have Buddhists and geeks share more of our goals and our methods and our practices. Um, in our family, I think Kelly would be a little bit more of the Buddhist, and I would be definitely way more of the geek. That's me dressed up like one of my favorite video game characters, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Katamari Damacy, super awesome game. Um, so Kelly, would you come up and join me? And we've been having a lot of interesting conversations in the last month or so leading up to this. Um, do you wanna, let's, let's, let's give them a little inside peek. Um, by the way, we were thinking about this idea of the, in every generation there are conservers and adapters um, that Jack shared with us this morning. And Kelly turned to me and said, that's what it is. I'm the conserver and you're the adapter. Uh, she also said to me over lunch that we're identical twins um, born six minutes apart. I'm younger. And she said, that's what it is. It's a generation gap. We had the whole generation gap. <laughs> So um, why don't you share some of the things that, that you were challenging me with and raising as questions? Well, I, the first thing I wanted to say is that in, this is the first time I've gotten to hear Jane's ideas uh, fully expressed relating now that she's been outed as a Buddhist. Uh, and so for the first time I was thinking about this question of awakening as an epic win. And, uh, and I, I had to think back in my own practice, has there been a time in my practice where I felt like I was putting in effort in something that I had little faith that I would succeed at? Uh, but because a trusted teacher told me, hey, do this practice, I think this is going to help. And it, it reminded me of some practices that I began maybe 10 years ago in order to, um, to improve some difficult relationships and to think of these difficult relationships as benefactors and to do gratitude practices for these people and these relationships. And I hope I wasn't one of them. You, you were not. <laughs> I won't say if it's anyone we're related to, but... Um, <laughs> But, you know, it, it, I found that it was very much like the process you described of, of epic wins where uh, a, a trusted teacher told me to do this. I did it. It was difficult. It was uncomfortable. But I had some faith. Uh, and the end result, after some sustained effort, really transformed the relationships in a way that did feel like an epic win. Like, this was not the, the way the relationship evolved was something I did not think was possible. Um, That's cool. And so that, and that is my only epic win because even though we're supposed to have the same genes, she got both of the gaming genes. <laughs> so I've never had any game actual epic wins. Um, but so one of the things that we were 
we're talking about and was inspired very much by Ethan's talk this morning. You know, I'm fully on board with the idea that gaming can be a practice that supports a lot of really great qualities, positive qualities. But uh, more often than that, I hear people interested in turning uh, mind training into a game and that games might actually replace the, the mind training practices that are more traditional, including those that I teach. And I was thinking about uh, how the Dharma always goes along with the teacher and the Sangha. And when I look at games like this and some of the other games I've seen developed to support mind training, I see where the Sangha is. I see that there's a lot of social interaction. Uh, and so my, my first question to you is where's the teacher? In yeah. The games. Yeah. Um, this is something I've been trying to think of a good answer to um, because it's difficult. Um, in some ways, I think that the game designer is like the teacher um, in that uh, they are sort of prescribing a practice. Mm -hmm. When you sit down in front of the game, you're going to do what the game designer has asked you to do. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that sense of leading the student slash player um, through the activity. Um, and then there's also maybe the opportunity for other players mm -hmm. to become teachers. So to see games not as something ever that you play alone, but that it's something that somebody brings to you and leads you with. So for example, one of my favorite games is Portal. And uh, it's kind of challenging. By the way, if, if you guys are gamers and are not gamers and you want to play a good game that will help you build up the gamer virtues, um, you can download a game called Portal for your computer and play it. You don't need special gaming equipment, so Portal. But Kiyosh played it first. Mm -hmm. My husband played it first, and he sat down next to me while I played, and like a very good teacher, he didn't tell me exactly how to do it, but was there to make sure I had support and guidance. And so maybe other players serve as teachers, or teachers serve as other players. Maybe something like that. Yeah. So I'm I'm glad that you said this idea of that you gamers are never playing alone because you know one of the things that we say is you shouldn't leave people alone with these practices. That and those of you who have a practice have probably had some really important instrumental support from teachers. Where when you when you hit certain difficulties in your practice, it is so important to be able to articulate out loud what is going on in your mind, what is going on in your life, and to get some sort of guidance on that to receive that personal guidance. And uh, it is true that in that on retreat or in teaching, sometimes the, uh, when a sangha comes together and shares what they're experiencing in their practice and in their life, sometimes in, in just hearing what other people are experiencing, even not mediated by the teacher, mm. that there, there can be a lot of support for the practice. Yeah, and that's something that gamers do. Gamers are prolific members of discussion forums where if you're stuck in a game, you go into the forum and people give you help. They create wikis to share their experiences and sort of build up collective knowledge about how to face these obstacles. Um, so it would be interesting to think about how those practices might support. Mm -hmm. You know, could you, could you support a Buddhist practice the way the gamers support each other? in these games. Now, one of the things that I found uh, intriguing that you suggested is that you could remove the teacher from a lot of settings and have some sort of technological platform that would serve the role of the teacher and that you might have similar experiences or outcomes taking the human out of the student-teacher interaction. Right, well, we were talking about a dance video game, like Dance Central, where if you wanted to learn how to dance, I suggested that maybe you were too shy to go to a class or you were too anxious to go to a class and be seen dancing in public, which we could imagine potential Buddhist practitioners yes. don't want to be seen at a Buddhist you know, class yet or they're too scared to go. Um, but you play this dance game, it teaches you the moves, uh, inspires you, encourages you to do it um, as, a, as a sort of introduction. Mm -hmm. um, granted, the game is only so good at making sure you're doing it correctly. I mean, it knows if you're stepping at the right way or time, um, but it's not a skillful teacher. But it mm -hmm. might serve as like the baby step teacher so mm -hmm. that you feel the confidence to show up at a real mm -hmm. dance class or dance club later on mm -hmm. down the line to get the real wisdom, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the things I was thinking about is how, and this is true for probably dance as well as for- We should be standing on the opposite side, Yeah, I know, way. I was thinking like, we should bridge this gap between gamers here and- uh, and, oh, also, I was just going to get us by our picture. <laughs> um, so, so we're uh, labeled correctly. <laughs> when, you know, when you are learning something from someone who is modeling that to you, and I think those of you who have had influential teachers in your life, 
Uh, my guess is that you had the sense that you learned a lot through kind of a direct transmission of seeing how these teachers are in relationship to you and in relationship to others. And that's true in a dance class too. A lot of the ways that we learn new movements, new ways of being in our bodies, is that we see it modeled. And seeing it modeled in real life mm. not only uh, activates mirror neurons, it makes it then easier to replicate that behavior, that skill, uh, but it also increases rapport and empathy and a sense of similarity with the person that we see modeling that. And uh, although there's more research on that with uh, physical movement, my guess is that is true with the things that we are training ourselves in, whether it's compassion or attention uh, or other virtues, that when we see that modeled in a human being and in relationship to us, it, it not only makes it easier for us to find that new way of being in the world, but that it gives us a sense of being like that thing that we aspire to, which would create the kind of um, confidence that you were referring to that we need for, for um, persevering in the face of challenges. Right, so here's a field of research that I don't think anybody's working on yet, but if they are, it will be at Stanford, okay. which is do avatars ever create mirror neurons? Yeah. That, would be a, that would be an open question. Um, but what I hear you say that I think is an important sort of takeaway is that there needs to be a role for a teacher, a face-to-face, Teacher. And not just because I don't want to be put out of a job. No, but because because <laughs> because the the practice is, is requires wisdom and requires empathy and being in person can mm -hmm. really help. Um, and I'm totally on board with that because the kinds of games that I like to make involve physical location and uh, and co presence and shared. Well, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, my sister, for being my awesome <laughs> geeky counterpoint. Um, we've reached the end of the session. Um, if you're interested in uh, chatting about these ideas more, maybe thinking up a game for Buddhist Geeks 2012, that's my email address, so that's my Twitter address. And um, I hope that these questions were intriguing for you. And if nothing else, um, I hope that you will play massively multiplayer thumb wrestling with your sangha and, uh, and, and try and uh, spread that a little bit more. Thank you.